You're listening to Covering the Fields with your host, Joe Ellison. Hello, sports fans. Welcome to Covering the Field, the weekly program that analyzes all sports, handicaps them, and makes and reviews predictions. I'm your host, Joe Ellison, and today we're going to talk about pro football, college football, the NBA, baseball, hockey, and our You Got Hosed segment. We'd like to remind you listeners to email us at coveringthefield at gmail.com. Please give us your feedback. Tell us your You Got Hose stories and listen to our fantasy football mock draft special. We'd like to give a mention to the Blue Bowl in Carson City. They are having an eight ball pool tournament on Saturday, August 21st at 1 p.m. The first 16 to sign up, double elimination, entry fee $10. Contact the Blue Bowl. But first off, this week, I'd like to introduce our NFL and basketball expert, Charles O'Laughlin. How are you doing today, Charles? I am excellent, Joe. How are you doing today? I'm starting to get a little more excited about football, actually. Uh, Last week was the first full week of preseason, and the big story was the performances of this year's rookie quarterbacks. Uh, In the order they were drafted in the first round, out of Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Mac Jones, and let's throw Jordan Love in there since he never saw the field last year because there were no exhibition games due to COVID. Out of those six, Charles, who impressed you? Kyler Murray and the Arizona Cardinals beating the Dallas Cowboys. That's who impressed me the most. That's uh, That didn't mention any of the guys I just mentioned on that whole list. Oh, I, know. I just wanted to see your face when you heard your Cowboys lost. Um, out of the most, you know, you can definitely tell they're a group of rookies. Um, all had big problems. They all hold on to the ball a little bit too long. They don't have a time clock yet. I would guess Mac Jones impressed me the most. After Mac Jones, I would have to go to Trevor Lawrence. After Lawrence, it would go, mm, it'd be a toss-up between Fields and Wilson. I'd probably put uh, Wilson a little above Fields and then Love. Well, I would have to say um, Fields was the best, I, I thought. You, you, you didn't mind almost all the picks that he threw and the overthrows and the underthrows and... Yeah, I He's just, a little quick on the trigger, I feel like, too. It reminds me a lot of the Sean Watson, those quarterbacks. I don't like those quarterbacks because they tend to move out of the pocket too much. Um, we'll see, though, you know. Yeah, it was his legs, you know, definitely was a big factor in that. Uh, if I was going strictly arm, I probably would have picked Wilson just looking at the Wilson arm strength. Nice arm, and, you know, I just want to say I, I completely forgot Trey Lance. Um, I don't. I didn't like what I saw. You know, I saw a couple big plays. Other than that, um, nothing really. There's, you know, a lot of overthrows, a lot of misthrows. Brandon Ayuk dropped three balls. I've been telling everybody all season, these guys can't run anything but slants. Ask them to run anything else, they're, they're going to be thinking too much. So um, if Kyle Shanahan's smart, which he is, I think his best option is to keep doing – Play action, you know. That's where that's that's what that team needs to base their game plans off of. If they want to get into sh- shotgun or be pretty, they're not going to win football games. Yeah, I I'm going to stick with Fields. I didn't think anybody was super impressive, but uh, you know, since our producer is a Bears fan, we're going to have a little bit of Bears trivia, Bears quarterback trivia. Uh, Oh, first I should ask, who is the only team to never have a 4,000-yard passer in a season? I think I gave that away already. Uh, Yeah, I think I kind of gave that. Um, Yes, over 16 games, that's averaging just 250 yards a contest. That's not a whole lot, and they haven't done that yet. Now, oh, it gets tougher. Who holds the Bears' record for most passing yards in a season? Oh, very tough one. Uh, it was probably before my generation, before I probably started watching football, Joe. So I'm going to pass on that. I, I don't know. Uh, if I told you if, if it was in 1995, would that help? I was two years old. I was not watching football, sir. So I, I would not be able to tell you. OK, well, the answer is Eric Kramer, the Eric Kramer, 
who threw for 3,838 yards in 1995. And the last one, last trivia question, who was the best quarterback in Bears history? Who's the one they won all those Super Bowls with? Mike, uh, Mike, Mike Dick is a uh, linebacker. Well, uh, well uh, they, Terry Brad, you know, he was a he was a Pittsburgh Steeler, wasn't he? Uh, yeah. 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 The Bears have only won one Super Bowl, and that was um, Jim Harbaugh uh, sitting there. Um, so, uh, no, who who was the quarterback? Oh, that was that was McMahon. Yeah, Jim McMahon. There you go. Yeah, I'm getting those guys mixed up. But that's not the answer. That's not the answer. Sid Luckman, back in the 40s, uh, oh. was a first-team All-Pro four times, led the NFL in passing yards and touchdowns three times, and won four championships. That's going to be tough to beat. Uh, he was one of the best quarterbacks ever. So they've been waiting a long time for a really good quarterback. And you're going to put Justin Fields there after one game? He has a chance to be the second best quarterback in Bears history. I don't see him ever catching up to Luckman. But yeah, after one game, you know, he doesn't have a whole lot to beat, I guess is the point I'm trying to make. So Charles, is there anything else so far in the preseason that caught your eye? Not really. You know, um, Trevor Lawrence did better than I expected. Um, We'll see how the Jaguars pan out this year. You know, they're, they're in a really easy division. So I, I think that's going to play towards Trevor's favor. Other than that, you know, there's a lot of the Browns, man. The Browns look really good. Um, I got a buddy who got them at 60-1 to 1 to win before they started signing all those players and stuff. Um, I got them at, I think, 16-1 to 1 or 15-1 to 1 to win the Super Bowl. I like them uh, coming out of the AFC. Uh, they're going to be they're going to be scary good, man. Well, I noticed uh, there are no more overtimes in the exhibition season, uh, so game is more likely to end in a tie. Now, usually, no one likes ties, but uh, that seems like a pretty good rule, don't you think? Yeah, you know, it uh, definitely put the um, fire on the Cardinals' butt to beat the Cowboys. So yeah, you know, I like that. Of course. And uh, Jacksonville and uh, Buddy and Coach Urban Meyer released. Tim Tebow. Did you have any uh, thoughts on that? Um, no, you know, I didn't really expect him to make the roster. I think he was more of a locker room guy. Uh, Urban's just doing his thing, man. You know, it's his first year. You got to let him do what he wants to do. Well, yeah, he is a locker room guy by all accounts and an outstanding human being. Uh, larger than life, great spiritual leader, like uh, having Jesus on your team. Yeah. Very religious. Uh, but at age 34, six years removed from playing quarterback and trying to play tight end and attempting a baseball career in between, it appears Tebow is uh, finished. Uh, he could try to uh, desperately hang on to his athletic career like an Afghani to an airborne U.S. military jet, but he'll have a much softer landing back in broadcasting where he's already worked for the SEC network. So, Charles, I know you don't bet on preseason games, uh, but on the, on the show last week, I picked New England and Pittsburgh to cover their spreads, and they both did. Ka-ching, ka-ching. And um, add that to my Hall of Fame game under bet, and I'm 3-0 and this year. Did you bet on the Cowboys? Uh, no, okay. I did not bet on the Cowboys. No. I could be due for a loss this week, but I'm going to go right back to New England, minus one and a half at Philadelphia tomorrow night. So, Charles... I think it's time we look at some player propositions for the upcoming NFL season. Who is going to lead the league in passing yards this year? Um, when I look at the list, you know, when it, when it comes to playing a prop, it needs to pay. You know, so someone's, you know, 5-1, to 8-1, one, to one, it's hard to sit on that type of money all season for a little bit payback. So I like double digits when I get there. So um, when I'm looking at passing leaders, I like Dak Prescott a lot. Uh, you know, it's going to depend on – a lot of things, but I think he's sitting at five to one right now because he is one of the favorites. Other than that, you always have to look at Russell Wilson, who's a twenty to one, Kyler Murray, who's an eighteen to one, um, and then my sleeper. People are gonna call me crazy. They got a lot better this year. They're gonna be in a lot of shootouts. I like Sam Darnold at eighty to one. Um, you know what's ten bucks? You know that's gambling money. What's five bucks? That's beer money. Five bucks to win. You know what? 
four hundred dollars. That's uh, that's that's a good payout. So uh, that's that's where I'm putting my money at. Is Sam Darnold, Ru Russell Wilson, Kyler Murray. Even though I like Dak, um, he's got to face Washington twice this year, and he's got a good couple expedition games. He's got to feed Zeke. I just don't know if he's going to be able to make it all, pull it off this year. Well, I'm in a state of shock. You're actually mentioning Dak Prescott's name. Uh, I thought you would just immediately cancel him out, but that's my pick. I, I think it's kind of an easy pick when you look at last year uh, when he got hurt. He was leading the NFL with 1,856 yards in five games, and he didn't even finish the fifth game. So it looked like he was on pace for 6,000 at that point. So now who is going to lead the league in rushing yards? Uh, you know, I like Zeke at 20 to 1, but you can't have a passing leader and a rushing leader in the same backfield. That's why you got to pick your poison there. And if you're going to pick one, I'd take Zeke at 20 to 1 over the 5 to 1 in Dak. Um, uh, but then again, you face that Washington defense twice. You're going to face that Arizona Cardinals defense, who who's, was 10th last year in the defensive overall defensive rating and added players. They got better, you know. So when you look at when you look at things like that, you have to take that into consideration. So other than that, you know, uh, running backs are extremely hard. They can be fragile. They can, you know, get hot. They can get cold. So. Derrick Henry, but he's three and a half to one. You know, there's there's no money in that. So, um, I I really don't have I don't like playing running backs like that. I, I try to stay away from that. Well, I don't mind seven to two odds, three and a half to one. Uh, it seems like an easy one again uh, to me. Uh, Derrick Henry outrushed Dalvin Cook by like 470 yards last year. He had 2,027 yards. Yeah, it's crazy. But, you know, there, there is, a, there is a, uh, a carry limit on these players. There's a point where you do start to feel those carries. You know, is it this year? Is it, I don't know. I'm, I'm counting on another big season from Derrick Henry. I'm going to stick with that. Uh, so, Charles, who will lead the league in receiving yards this season? This one seemed like the toughest one to pick to me. Yeah, you know, and the odds start good at 12-1 to 1 with uh, Stephon Diggs and DeAndre Hopkins, DK Metcalf, you know, Michael Thomas, Mike Evans. Uh, those guys usually face number one corners, you know, get double teams. So I try to stay away from those guys, even though D-Hop seems to go off every freaking year, no matter who his quarterback is. So, But when, you, when, you, when you're looking at plays like that, um, call it a homer pick. I like A.J. Green at 75-1. to 1. You know, back years ago when he was on that good Bengals squad, he was putting up 12, 13, 1,400 yards a season for six, seven years straight. He was on a Hall of Fame path. You know, now he's got the quarterback. He's got a running game, good defense. He's going to be a number – I don't even know if he's going to be a number two receiver when you look at what Rondell Moore did in that preseason game. Christian Kirk and um, Andy Isabella, you got, you got speed on the field. He's the old 32-year-old that's supposed to be broken down. So, I mean, it's easy to get those, you know, those slant patterns and take off with them when you're facing third, fourth corners. Other than that, um, Marquise Brown is 200 to 1. You know, uh, I like Kyle Pitts, though, at 200 to 1. That's my other big pick. Uh, I think he's going to be Matt Ryan's number one target. He's going to line up against a lot of linebackers and safeties. You're not going to put a corner on him. <laughs> and he's 6'6", 240. Uh, the linebacker's not going to be able to keep up with him. The safety's going to be too small. I think 200 to 1, you know, 10 bucks to win two grand. Uh, that's the type of market I'm in. Well, you know, Stefan Diggs had the most yards last year. Devontae Adams had the highest average per game, got hurt in a couple games. Uh, I was leaning towards the Falcons, too. I, you're looking at Calvin Ridley, but he's the favorite. Uh, that's the problem. He was only 10 to 1. Yeah, I could see Pitts or Ridley really going off because they don't really have anybody else with Julio Jones no longer in Atlanta. So I'll take Ridley, but uh, I'm not thrilled about picking the receivers. So quickly switching over to the NBA, Charles. Last week you predicted the Los Angeles Clippers trading Patrick Beverly and others to Philadelphia for Ben Simmons. What actually happened? Yeah, I, I was right about the Beverly trade. I saw it coming. You know, he's a uh, – shouts out to Pat Bev, man. Being a Clippers fan, I've watched him play many years. Great player, championship – he's a guy you want on a championship team. Um, but the Clips dealt him out. 
him, Rajon Rondo, and another player to the Grizz. Daniel Oturu? Yeah. Thank Who's you. that? Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know who he is, to be honest with you. But um, to the Memphis Grizzlies for uh, Eric Bledsoe, you know, who's a, who's a good player. Used to be a clip back in the day. He's a little bit older. He's been a buck. You know, he's a good ball handler, can score, brings attitude, defensive player. Really good. Within 24 hours, the Grizz turn around and trade Pat Bev to um, Minnesota. Tim- yeah, the Timberwolves for uh, Jarrett Culver, who went to Texas Tech. Good point. Uh, good point guard, shooting guard. He can play a one or a two, and then um, Juancho Hernan Gomez. I just <laughs> watched you. him playing for Spain in the Olympics. Yeah, he actually looked you, okay. He's not bad. He's a good forward. He's a role player. Um, someone that's going to come off the bench who's going to help that Grizz squad. The Grizz are adding young talent, getting deeper, um, because that does matter when you start making playoff runs. And now there's rumors going around that um, the only reason the Timberwolves made that trade is because they're – they're actually loaded with some young talent and some draft picks in the future. They're trying to make a deal for Ben Simmons. So Pat, Pat Beverly might end up being part of a deal for Ben Simmons. Um, but it just goes to show you, you know, you might not like Pat Bev's attitude or the cockiness he brings to the court, but that's how good of a player he is. He's already been swapped to two different teams for players to add depth. And, may, I mean, Colvert might even be a, be a starter for the um, Grizz. So it's going to be interesting. And finally, Charles, Philadelphia's Joel Embiid just signed a four-year, $196 million contract this week. Isn't that too much for a player who is injury-prone? Uh, it's all perspective, Joe. You know, honestly, uh, Philadelphia wants to build their team around him. So if, that's, if, if you think you got a star in him, if that's your guy, I've said it before, it's not just the injuries for me. He's too inconsistent. Um, if that's what you think of the guy, though, good for him. You know, I think it, we're, we're all learning. If you have children or grandchildren, have them play basketball. Football, there's no there's no more money in football. It's all in basketball right now. Guys are making $50 million a year. It's almost a million. It's, there, there's only 80 games a season, right, 82 games. You think you're with the times rested and hurt. Guy only plays 50 games. He might be making a million a game. There's, there's no more money anywhere else other than basketball. Um, it's crazy. Good for these guys. They're getting paid. Yeah, I'd say 50 mil a year is a little out of control. Well, thank you, Charles, for your insight. And we'll have you back next week to talk some more NFL football. Thank you, Joe. With college football starting a week from Saturday, it's time to introduce a new guest to our show, Big Richard Martin. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thank you, Joe. It's great to be here. So the Associated Press and coaches polls have come out. In defending champion Alabama's number one, again, with an over and under win total proposition of 11 and a half. Does the Crimson Tide go undefeated during the regular season? Well, that's a great point, Joe. Alabama usually does uh, go undefeated or only loses one game, so that's a pretty safe pick. I mean, as we looked at last week, Gator gave us great information about some people making some pretty hefty wages on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and I think that Alabama going 12-0 and is a much better, safer pick than taking the Tampa Bay going 17-0. and In the Big Ten, which incidentally has 14 teams, Ohio State's last league loss was in 2018. Do the Buckeyes win the conference again? Well, as we know, C.J. Fields has left the field. And so I think the field's open this year for the Big Ten or the Big 14, as you put it. I think that we have a good chance this year that Ohio State does get knocked off this year. In the Big 12, which incidentally has 10 teams, Oklahoma has won the conference six consecutive seasons. Can any team dethrone the Sooners? Well, as you know, Oklahoma is the uh, major favorite here. Um, but I think they do roll this year through the Big 12. Um, they have their uh, Heisman Trophy candidate, uh, Spencer Rattler, coming back. He had 3,000 yards last year. He uh, threw for 16 touchdowns. He's just a great pick, and I think they just roll again this year. Is Clemson a shoe-in to win the ACC? Well, I don't think that they are this year. I think there's a lot of competition this year. I think that um, coming from the West, um, out of the ACC, you have North Carolina coming up there, and they're going to be very uh, heavy competitive with them. Well, if college football's playoff was to start today, those four teams I mentioned would almost certainly be 
the ones invited by the committee to be in the playoff, which schools are most likely the ones to upset that scenario? Well, I think if you look at uh, Iowa State, they have two starters coming back to quarterback and they're, uh, and they're running back. I mean, they have a good chance of dethroning the Oklahoma. Um, you have Texas A&M, you know, rated number six. Uh, you have Jimbo Fisher out there uh, with a lot of returning starters. So they could give um, the SEC East a run for their money. Well, the Pac-12 hasn't had a team reach the playoffs since 2016. So I'm thinking it is more likely uh, two teams from – Alabama's Southeastern Conference get in. And uh, as you know, Georgia has JT Daniels returning, and I think that they will give an also good run, and they'll be in the final. So, Richard, uh, who wins this year's national championship? Well, this year's national championship will be, um, of course, Alabama repeating again. For the last 30 years, every national champion has started in the top 25, so you need not look any further than that. Um, but only uh, once out of the last five times that Alabama was preseason number one did they actually go on to win the title. And Ohio State's last championship was in 2014. Alabama, Ohio State, and Clemson all starting different quarterbacks this year. It, sh it seems like it should be Oklahoma's year. The Sooners' odds have gone down from 7.5 to 1 to 6.5, so I'm not the only one who thinks so. During the past three seasons, an average of 10 preseason top 25 teams don't stay there. Is this Nevada's year to finish in the top 25? Well, I think that's a pretty safe pick. Um, they have a returning quarterback this year, and um, it's a pretty weak division out here in the Mountain West. So I think that they do have a favorable schedule, and I think that you can see the Nevada in the top 25. I'm totally expecting it. There's a proposition sheet with numerous over and under win totals on it. Um, what are the rules considering those props this year? Well, what caught my eye on this is that if, regardless of the 2021-22 regular season, any forfeited games do not count the amount of the regular season wins. So that being said, that they will not receive any action if one team doesn't play in their game. So with the COVID raising its head this season, if the COVID uh, team cannot play and you have Alabama going uh, over the 11 and a half, that will be counted out and you would get your money back, but you will not get your win. Did any of those over and under props appear to be worth betting on? Well, uh, if you look at, um, if you look at Georgia at 10 and a half, I think they have JT Daniels coming back. Um, his last four games, uh, he was phenomenal and, uh, he just blew out Cincinnati in his bowl game. Um, he's just an outstanding guy coming back. He's the, uh, USC uh, transfer in from a couple of years ago. He uh, had an ACL injury in 2017, and uh, then he uh, is back last year, and so he'll be doing his junior year this year for the Georgia Bulldogs, and I think there's going to be great things coming from him. Well, I can't help but uh, go with the local team. Nevada is 7.5. The over looks like a strong bet to me. Uh, Richard, do you have a favorite for the Heisman Trophy this year? All right, the Heisman Trophy... Uh, winner, as you know, um, 21 times during this millennium, only three times as a non-quarterback won the Heisman Trophy. And we're not counting Reggie Bush because he didn't get a Heisman Trophy, but he did get a Heisman wife. So uh, Devontae Smith won it last year, and he went off at 100 to 1 odds last year, so he wasn't even on the books. So this year, uh, we're looking at most of these going to be quarterbacks, and there's a lot of good picks this year. Well, Oklahoma quarterbacks have a strong recent history. You did mention uh, Smith's Rattler is the favorite. Uh, Baker Mayfield won in 2017, Kyler Murray won in 2018, and Jalen Hurts finished second in 2019. Look for the favorite, Spencer Rattler, 3-1 to one right now to win it. So, Richard, do you have any other possible favorites? Um, yes, as you said, there's uh, three out of the four teams in the top four have uh, starting new quarterbacks, and we'll start with uh, Clemson's DJ Ugalalai. Uh, he is the quarterback coming in. He started uh, two games last year for Trevor Lawrence while he was uh, out with COVID protocol. And as when he came in, he also threw for 470 yards against Notre Dame and came to an 18-point comeback last year against Boston College. So he's a good pick. He's also 250 pounds and six foot four. So in comparison to Junior Seau, six foot three, 250. So he's a big guy with a big cannon. He's a good pick to look for that. Um, also, Big Sam Howe out of North Carolina. Uh, he's a third-year starter underneath the powder blue of North Carolina. He has some great 
uh, returning lineman. He did lose some of his stars on the outside, some of his position players, but he is the position player. He's going to have a great year. He's going to challenge Clemson for the championship. And finally, Richard, do you have any good bets for week one of the college football season? Yes, week one, uh, we have a great game in Nebraska and Illinois. Uh, Nebraska, as you know, has Scott Frost. Uh, this is his third year as the coach of the Nebraska Cornhuskers. He had that magical season in 2017 with the UCF. A great guy, great Cornhusker. I think he comes back and they smack Illinois for beating them so bad last year. And they will get a win. They will cover the sevens point spread. Take UCLA over there beating the Rainbow Warriors. That's the big Richards pick of the week. Well, thank you, Richard. And hopefully we'll have you back again soon for some more college football talk and predictions. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now we're moving on to the big leagues and speaking with our baseball expert, Ronnie McKinnon. How are you doing today, Ronnie? I'm doing great, Joe. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, when we last talked, Ronnie, it was the day before the Field of Dreams game between the Chicago White Sox and New York Yankees. How did that game turn out? Yeah, that ended up being pretty exciting. It was like 7-4, to four, the White Sox, and then uh, the Yankees scored four runs in the ninth and went ahead 8-7, to seven, and then the White Sox came back in the bottom of the ninth with a two-run home run and won 9-8. to eight. So it, it was a pretty exciting game. Uh, yeah, I thought it was pretty amazing. Yeah, there was like eight home runs, four for each team, and... Um, the big save guy for, for Chicago, uh, Liam Hendricks, actually blew the save and then ended up getting the win in the, in the, uh, because Chicago ended up winning the game. So, Well, 8,000 fans got their money's worth, dishing out uh, up to $4,000 for a ticket. Dyersville, Iowa, uh, turned out to be the best sporting event in Iowa history. Maybe the best event ever in Iowa yeah, it was great. Well, they, you know, they built uh, MLB, Major League Baseball, built that field. And on the other side of the cornfields is the original field from the movie. So, um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty exciting stuff. Well, yeah, the final score was eight to nine and the Field of Dreams was released in 89. That's correct. That's right. There's the connection. And yeah, it, it was my kind of game with eight home runs. That's the kind I, I root for all the time when I watch baseball. Ended with uh, Tim Anderson's walk-off two-run homer. The 15th time the White Sox hit a walk-off homer against the Yankees. The first one? Would you know who did that? No, I don't know. Shoeless Joe Jackson, that, of yeah, course. That's, that's been yeah. a while. I, I who the, the movie... Name, but is, yeah, that's been a long time. That's who the movie is yeah. about, or one of the characters. Right. Yes. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. So, so it, it did get the highest ratings for a regular season game since 2005. And it was ironic that it was Tim Anderson who had hit the game winner, who, a player who was noted for calling baseball boring. Uh, that game was anything but boring. Right. The, the thing that kills me is that I'm, I'm a big guy against all these walks, especially by relief pitchers. And the guy on base before he hit the home run was walked. And so there's, there's the tying run and then the winning run. And, and it happens a lot in baseball now, just way too many walks by, especially by relief pitchers that are supposed to be specialists and come in for like an inning, you know. So, um, but anyway, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was a great game. So having seen this great game, do you think they'll play this, another version of this game again next year? Yeah, it's already set for next year. Um, they will be playing next year. It's uh, Chicago, the Cubs and the Reds, I believe. I think I heard something about it being Cubs. Uh, it could be a problem yeah. with uh, the Cubs being so terrible this year. Maybe fans would rather see somebody better. Well, next year could be totally different. You know, they, they got rid of a lot of people, but they got some good people in return and they can build from there. So, you know, you can't say they're not good. They're going to be this bad next year. You know, we just don't know. We'll see what happens. But it's great that they're going to have another game there. So, Ronnie, we had another historic baseball event last week. As Saturday, we had our eighth no-hitter this year, tying a major league record set in 1884. Tell us some more about that. Yeah, that was great. That was the eighth one. Um, it was actually the f fourth one by in history for um, a, a rookie that to start his first game 
there's actually been 24 rookies who have thrown no hitters, but that was, uh, he's one out of four that actually didn't in his first start. He had gone into a, a three games, I think, as a reliever. So, um, and, and, and it's pretty interesting, too, because he was a um, draft five pick. A uh, draft five pick is like every year in December, they'll, uh, a team with a non 40 man roster can pick a player from another team with a non 40 man roster and pay 100000 for him. And that's how they got. Tyler Gilbert from the Dodgers is for a hundred grand through a draft five. So, so the last time a pitcher threw a no hitter in his first outing ever trivia, Bobo Holloman in 1953. We all remember good old Bobo, right? 19, uh, 1884 was uh, also the first year the national league allowed overhand pitching. That's correct, Chell. They, they, used to th they used to throw underhand. Um, they wanted a lot of hitting, like they still do nowadays. But, um, yeah, 1884 is when they started throwing overhand. And that could uh, factor in for the eight no-hitters that year. They probably just weren't used to overhand pitching, maybe. Right. I'm surprising they didn't have more, actually, when you think about it. So. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I, I can't remember who Arizona played in that, in that game. Uh, but uh, I know they hit the ball hard. But they just seem to be. Uh, oh, and the no hitter, yeah. Yeah, they, whoever they that actually shut out the Padres. The Padres, yeah, yeah. A really good hitting team. And they hit the ball so, really hard, but they just seem to hit right. it right at people. And that happens a lot. Uh, usually, when you do that during the game, through the nine innings, they'll start falling for some for some hits and maybe some runs. But it didn't happen. So, Ronnie, the pennant races continue to heat up. What has happened since we talked last week? Well, it's pretty interesting now. The Yankees are starting to move up. Boston's starting to fall down. But they're, uh, along with Oakland in the American League, they're all, like, tied for the, uh, the wild card situation right now. But um, actually, Toronto is only four games out of the wild card. Seattle's actually only four games out of the wild card. Um, Houston still leads the, 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 the central division. But so it's, um, it's gotten a little tighter there. Um, also in the East, in the National League, Atlanta's kind of pulled up ahead. Um, Philadelphia and New York, is, the Mets have kind of fallen. Um, but they're all still in for the division and the wild card. Um, the Central, Cincinnati, is actually only a game and a half out. Actually, they already lost this afternoon. So now they're two games behind the wild card of Milwaukee. Um, St. Louis is only four games back. Um, so that's pretty tight. Uh, San Diego's fallen 12 behind the Giants now, but they still have a, a wild card lead um, of only a game and a half now. Um, and the Dodgers are like well into the, um, um, the first wild card and eight games ahead of anybody. So, so the Dodgers look pretty strong and then we're going to have a fight for the other uh, wild cards, it appears. Yeah, they're all they're all look pretty, uh, you know, like, uh, and there's still 40 plus games to go. So it's going to be interesting. So, Ronnie, numerous proposition sheets were put out before the season started, uh, such as uh, regular season leaders and hits, runs batted in, home runs and strikeouts. Which players look like winners in any of those categories? Well, there, you know, when it comes to triple crown, which is which is average home runs, RBIs, um, there's really, um, I'd say that the only one that's some, somewhat close, Va Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And he is like in fourth and second and third in those three categories. So, um, and it's hard to, it's hard to do a, a triple crown. When it comes to MVP leaders right now, it's Tatis for San Diego and it would be Otani for, uh, from the Angels. And, uh, of course, there's also the Cy Young that also has voting, there, like yes. the MVP. Cy Young, yes. And, um, of course, DeGrom would have been right up there. But um, just like for ERA, you have to um, pitch a certain amount of innings. And now he's dropped below that amount. It's usually like one per game, so like 162 for the year. Um, so Lance Lynn for the White Sox, though, is, um, is, could be a leader there. Um, and then, of course, with the ERA leaders, um, it's become now Walker Bueller for the Dodgers is leading in ERA at 209. 
So, um, uh, and strikeout leaders, Zach Wheeler, Garrett Cole from the Yankees. Though all these things can change with that many games to go, so. And finally, Ronnie, the Little League World Series starts tomorrow. Will you be watching? Totally. It's, it's great to watch. I played Little League, in the, and, it's, and it's great. It's in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. They didn't have it last year because of COVID. It's, uh, there's 16 teams, and it's double elimination, and it'll start tomorrow and go through the 29th. It'll be on ESPN. The last couple games and the championship game will actually be on ABC. So, Ronnie, thank you for your insight. We'll hear from you again, and we'll talk some more baseball. Well, thanks, Joe, for having me. Our final guest today, who, like me, is a lover of all sports, is Gator Gates. How are you doing today, Gator? Oh, I'm great, Joe. Thank you for asking. Gator, we are both huge National Hockey League fans, and I had to bring up the signing of Joe Thornton by the Florida Panthers. What can you tell us about that move? Well... Uh, Thornton is going to join uh, also quarterback Hurricanes King. Uh, they agreed to an NIL agreement. The King deal was done on August 8th, which makes him the first collegiate athlete to sign with a pro team. Now, he, King will appear at some games and events, plus engage with fans on social media and produce digital contact content. Um, Panthers also said that they value diversity and would like female athletes from the Olympics to be part of their program as well. So that'd be interesting to have Thornton, King, and a couple of the Olympic girls would be pretty good marketing. Yes, this name, image, and likeness, uh, Derek King being a quarterback for the University of Miami, joining in with the Florida Panthers. That's a first. That's a first, correct. And uh, our... Uh, Olympic girls totally dominated the uh, medal count, so it's a good for them I too. I think that the Olympic girls are in very high demand right now in any any sports uh, market team. And I, I think when the Winter Olympics come up, I think they're going to dominate again. Probably, yeah. Our girls are second to none. I agree with that. Well, uh, this Thornton deal, you know, I'm. I'm I used to be a big fan. It's a one-year deal. He was drafted in 1997. Uh, he's 42 years old, his 24th year in the league, leads the NHL in scoring among active players, 14th in history, surefire Hall of Famer. Uh, special me because he was drafted by my Boston Bruins. And I'll never forget the day after he was traded to the San Jose Sharks and some snooty Shark fan tried to rub in the fact that they were getting such a great player but I got the last laugh because Boston won the Stanley Cup in 2011, while San Jose is still trying to win its first one. Sorry, Sharks fans. But the Panthers are Thornton's fourth team, and now I wish him well. Me too, Joe. That's great. You know, Gator, hockey is right around the corner, you know, as odds are already out for the October 12 games. Uh, any thoughts on that, or a little, a little early? Well, it's a little early, Joe, but looking at these odds, they have the Blackhawks playing the Avalanche, and Blackhawks are at a plus 250. The Avalanche are at a minus 300. I think that is a little crazy. Um, I would be putting money on the Blackhawks right now. That's a crazy number, and that's the biggest long shot on the board. The Blackhawks might have an advantage in goal, too. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, look at how... Uh, um, Mark andre Fleury. Yeah, just drew a blank, yeah. Look how Mark andre Fleury did against the Avalanche in the playoffs. Um, so I think 250 is really, really crazy, pretty high. I'm thinking that will go down. Right, so I would jump on it as soon as possible. So, Gator, do we have some XFL football news to share? Yeah. Um, what I found was that the XFL announced last Wednesday to start up again in 2023. Uh, that was after they had talks with the Canadian Football League for collaboration and innovation. Both sides said it was a positive and constructive, but no formal agreement was made. Now, uh, Dwayne Johnson and Red Bird Capital Partners paid $15 million for the league last year. That's uh, the XFL was the WWE-related WWE league but that's they, correct yes. yes they're not uh, as crazy with the rules as they were the first time around and then covid hit and they had to stop 
You, and uh, I really wish I knew what they were talking about. That would be very interesting to be a fly on the wall for that conversation. So you did mention the Canadian Football League had its second regular season week. What have you seen so far? Well, Joe, the first game, um, well, actually all four games went under this week. So if you take last week and this week, out of eight games, seven of them have gone under. Um, I think the trend's going to stay that way going into this week as well, just because of the matchup. Now, right now, the Lions are 1-1, one and, one, and the books have them at 9-1. to one. I think it's very iffy, but I am rooting for the Lions to do better this year than they have in the past. Um, now, Calgary, on the other hand, they too are at 9-1 and one as well. But for a long shot, I would just put some money on the Lions um, before they play against the Elks next week because I think that uh, the number is going to go down once they play the Elks. Winnipeg is at a three and a half to win the Grey Cup right now. Now, they do play each other again this week. Um, it's going to be in Toronto, but I would expect the Blue Bombers to come out victorious again. I don't see anything that Toronto is going to do to stop them. So that's your prediction, Winnipeg? Winnipeg, correct. The Hamilton Tigers, uh, who, who were the favorites at the beginning of the season at 3-1, to one, are now 0-2, and, and the odds are at 5-1. to one. Both losses were on the road, but when your quarterback goes 17 for 25, only 135 yards, no touchdowns, and two interceptions, it is hard to win any game. All right. Wow. That was awesome. I've never seen anybody watch so much Canadian football before. But you are a Canadian guy. You like your hockey. Oh, I love, I love Canadian football. And, and they are showing the games on TV from time to time, Time too. to time, yes, they are. And, and this, these are real games, not preseason games no. or exhibition games. This counts. So I'm, I'm all for it. I bet on Canadian football last week. I'm cool with it. All right. Well, thank you, Gator. I thank you, Joe. Uh, appreciate your help and we'll talk again uh, with some more football Sounds coming great. up all right man so now ladies and gentlemen it's that time for the moments we've all been waiting for the stories that make us angry about bets that appeared surely to be winners but in the end something went horribly wrong and they ended up being losers it's a segment we affectionately call you got hosed you got hosed so gator do you have a, a you got hosed moment from this week or maybe some other time? Yeah, Joe, I do. This one's a horse racing bet. I um, had a customer uh, watching the horses. They were coming down for the post parade. He comes up. He makes a bet. Give him the ticket. He goes down. He sits down. Uh, he's talking to his buddies, and the horses are up at the gate. And as he's looking at it, he just he decides that he has the wrong horse that he called out. And he wanted to change it real fast. So he comes running up to the counter, gives me the ticket. I put it in to void it. And as soon as I do that, the horses are off. I couldn't void it. So he goes back. And the horse that he had on his ticket actually got out of the gate first. And he was running. And it was a double digit. So I wanted to say it was about 15 to 1, but I'm going to say 10 to 1 just to make sure I don't exaggerate. And the horse... The horse that he picked was a closer. A closer horse is a horse that will stay back until the very sixth, seventh lanes and start coming back up. And it was a head bob, and the horse that he wanted actually won. So I would say that he hosed himself. But more importantly, why I'm bringing this story up is because we're getting into football. And I see a lot of customers, they'll take the ticket and just walk away. What I'm trying to get at is I just make sure that you look at your tickets before you leave the counter because it's a lot easier for the rider to avoid that ticket at the time than it is if you leave and come back. So, Big Richard, do you have a you got hose moment? Absolutely, I do, uh, Joe. On August 7th, I'm thinking I'm going to make a little bit of beer money myself, and I'm going to take the brew crew over the Giants. It was the bottom of the ninth, one out away, and a fly ball set of S.L. Garcia. And it was a, wasn't a can of corn, but it was a routine fly ball. It bounces in front of him on the warning track. And the brew crew and my beer money got hosed. Now, Joe, 
Do you have any hosed moments? You know, I'm kind of lucky or maybe not lucky. I didn't get hosed a whole lot this week. My bets were bad enough where it wasn't close enough to be hosed or they actually ended up doing well. But I could see where other people got hosed. Uh, last Saturday, I bet this Antonio Russell, Emmanuel Rodriguez fight, and I bet the over 10 and a half rounds. And 16 seconds into the fight, they butt heads and the fight is over. And it's a no contest. Had you been betting the under on the fight, you would think you might have a winner. It only went 16 seconds. But in reality, when a fight is a no contest, all bets are refunded. So not only a you got hose moment, but an educational moment for all you listeners out there. You got hosed. So that's it for this week. I'd like to thank my guests, Charles O'Laughlin, Ronnie McKinnon, Gator Gates, and Big Richard Barton, and our producer, our engineer, our editor, and everyone for listening. And we'd like you to listen to our fantasy football mock draft special. And in a couple of weeks, we'll be launching our Covering the Field website. We'd like to remind you listeners to email us at coveringthefield at gmail.com. Give us your feedback and your You Got Hose moments and any other, the comment, any other comments you'd like to give us. Hopefully you all enjoyed the show and you'll hear us again next week on another episode of Covering the Field. You've been listening to Covering the Field. A CM World Services and Lesage production. 